All right. Global climate change. Wait, wait, look. Drink tap water. There's still plenty of that available. Just saying. Okay. So, chapter 18 kind of goes with atmospheric pollution. You can see how that would go together. All right. So, these are the things we're going to do. Yay. South Florida. My God, we're part of the whole book. Where do we think that is? Downtown Miami, Sweetwater. It's not like they haven't seen this before. At least six times a year, saltwater intrusion will bubble up from the ground and flood the streets. Like I have to read this to you. You could be watching the news or the Weather Channel, but we know you don't do either one of them. So I have to read you this that talks about Miami. I know, it's ridiculous. So the floods are a relatively new phenomenon because of what? Rising sea levels. We know rising sea levels in Florida are going to be an issue because we're made up of that limestone. There's no way to block the ocean. It's coming up from underneath. There's not much we can do except to stop climate change. Well, you know, let's at least impede it or something. Okay? So here, they rose 20 centimeters. Oh my goodness. Listen, I, it's on a yardstick in my little camera, so it's like 20 centimeters. You figure it out. Okay? As warming temperatures expand seawater, even if we didn't add more, if we just heated it up, we know warmer water takes up more space. Why? Because as molecules move, we know that kinetic energy thing. As temperatures rise, they space out a little bit more. Okay, so now we've got movements from, you can hear the bunnies from the outside, sorry. So all coastal cities are facing challenges from flooding and increased storms that arise from sea level increase. South Florida, all this stuff, really was originally barrier islands. Barrier islands are, by definition, islands of sand that move. Yeah, it's a good plan. Everyone, buy a hovercraft. Because, you know, we can go from water to land to water to land. Otherwise, there's not going to be any other way for us to get around South Florida. It lies on flat, porous limestone. Only we knew that in advance, making it especially vulnerable to flooding. Miami alone, has more than 400 billion in assets. What they're not showing you here are the 50,000 cranes that are still up and still building, even though we know we're flooding, but you know, there's money to be had. Okay, Miami Beach is currently undergoing a building boom. It's like I read these things or I watch the news, one or the other. And its state level leaders are largely in denial. Yeah, if you've seen them interviewed, uh, vote when you're 18, folks. Vote for, you know, someone who can string two whole sentences together that makes sense. So local leaders, including county commissioners and mayors, have worked to build up dunes, which are good. Those are natural barriers. Raise building foundations. Fabulous. So now they don't flood. Okay. Shift development inland and stop subsidizing insurance for low-lying coastal areas. You go to Miami, they've raised the roadways, but then what happens is all those storefronts are now underwater and you have to like walk down to get to them and they flood every time. It's ridiculous, but you know, let's keep doing that. All right, so climate influences virtually everything around us and climate change looks to be the phenomenon that shapes, that most shapes the near future for young people. That be you. Okay, that, that not be me. All right, so climate describes an area's long-term atmospheric conditions. Long term, not like I look outside today and I go, ooh, pretty weather. Okay, we know this. So we need to know over long term, temperature, precipitation, wind, humidity, barometric pressure, and solar radiation. These are all things that contribute to climate. But it's long term. It's not like next week it's going to rain. That's the weather. So global climate change, generally referred to as climate change, because you know, putting the global in front of it makes it too long, describes changes in temperature, precipitation, and frequency and intensity of storms across the world. Storms, have you, did we see the last one? It was like over, we, luck, we lucked out. It like got stuck over the Bahamas at a cap five for days. I mean, wiped it out, man. Wiped out the Africa. So global warming refers specifically to an increase in the Earth's average temperature and is only one aspect of climate change. It does vary naturally, but usually it takes 
thousands of years for this amount of temperature to increase. We know we've had hotter climates. We know we've had colder ones. It varies, but thousands of years to make the change. Not freaking since the Industrial Revolution. How many years is that? I don't know, 150, 200? You know, that's math I can't do. So, three factors. The sun, okay, that's not going away. We're happy that it provides light and warmth. The atmosphere, which prevents major temperature shifts. The ocean, which store and transport heat and moisture. And we've gone on and we've talked about the temperature, um, how it's moderated on this planet because of the high um, amount of energy that our oceans can absorb from the sun's rays before they change temperature. We've had this conversation before, whether you were listening or not, that's something else. So there was a question like this on the APES exam, I think like two years ago, or maybe it was 2010, you know, these things blur together for me. The sun supplies most of our planet's energy, which the atmosphere absorbs, reflects most of it before it even reaches the surface. So look at the numbers. So there was actually a test question where it took some of the numbers away, like instead of where it says reflected solar radiation, it just had this amount, and you had to calculate reflected solar radiation. And the first time I looked at it, Okay, not gonna lie, I was like, what kind of like derivatives am I doing, integrals, what am I doing? And then I looked at the answer because I had the answer and then I realized, oh look, I'm doing subtraction. And it was that easy. So pay attention when you're doing some of these things, I've told you some of the questions really are eliminate the stupid answer, okay? And this question here literally had you, you know, subtracting this from all of this and that was the answer. So greenhouse gases warm the lower atmosphere. We want some because we don't want to freeze, but we don't want too many. There has to be a happy medium, which is why we were called or are called the Goldilocks planet. It's not too hot, it's not too cold, it's a happy medium. Atmospheric gases having three or more atoms in their molecule tend to absorb infrared radiation given off by the Earth's surface, then re-emitted back downward. These are called greenhouse gases. You must know these. You must be able to identify greenhouse gases. You must be able to pull them out of your brain in case you are asked for them in an FRQ, okay? No greenhouse gases, I'm just saying. Water vapor, yes, that is one. Ozone in the troposphere, bad. Carbon dioxide, nitrous oxide, and methanes in those halocarbons. So the rewarming of the lower atmosphere by the emitting of infrared energy by these gases is called the greenhouse effect. It's like, you know, like a glass house, which is no good. So here's some potentials. Here's some of the information. Once again, do you need to know it now? Do you need to be able to read it? Maybe graph it. If they gave you this data, could you graph it? Say yes, okay? So say yes. Global warming potential is the relative ability of a greenhouse gas molecule to contribute to warming. So which one you'd, be, you'd have to look at this, they give you this information and know which one is going to contribute the most, how much effect it's going to have, but off the top of your head, do you have to know those numbers? No, we know there's not a lot of numbers you need to know. So methane, for example, is 84 times more potent than carbon dioxide. How do we know? Because look, here's an 84 and here's a one. So. It's been present throughout the Earth's history and has kept the planet warm enough to support life. Yes. Once again, there have been variables. You can see it in ice cores, mud samples, things like that. So over the past 250 years, okay, now we know, someone did the math, humans have caused a net accumulation of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, primarily due to the release of carbon in fossil fuels during combustion. Know that. Release of carbon in fossil fuels during combustion. Okay, remember, you can't just say greenhouse gas. You can't just say carbon dioxide. You have to tie them all together. A, B, C, connect the dots for them. Even though it makes sense in your head and you assume that they know what you're talking about, no, they don't. They haven't met you. Number one, they're having a hard time reading your handwriting to begin with. So you need to connect the dots for them, especially in your FRQs, which there are only three, and we know it's worth 40%. So 
So here's some more data that they're showing you. Do you have to know the numbers? I can say this over and over again. No, you do not. Do you have to be able to interpret it from a picture like this? Yes. So combustion of fossil fuels transfers carbon from one reservoir to another. So, because we know nothing is created or destroyed, we're just recycling it. It's a matter of how we're keeping it. Are we shoving it into the atmosphere or is it being stored, I don't know, in say big, huge trees? Good, being released because we burn those trees through the process of burning and now it's not being sequestered, bad, all right? Forests and other reservoirs have been cleared, reducing the biosphere and ability to remove carbon dioxide. Oh look, same picture. Nitrous oxide in the atmosphere has increased primarily due to auto emissions, feedlots, and the use of synthetic nitrogen fertilizers. So if you talk about fertilizers in with greenhouse gases, you have to put together that they're talking about nitrogen fertilizers. You can't just say fertilizer because then what are you talking about? We don't know. Just because it makes sense in your head, you have to be able to put it down to paper, okay? Ozone concentrations in the troposphere has also grown the result of what? Photochemical smog, which you should remember from the PowerPoint that I did yesterday or whenever it is you're playing it, I don't know. From the other chapter, just go with me on that one. All right, so aerosols are microscopic droplets that can have either a warming or cooling effect when present in the atmosphere. Soot, we mentioned that when we were talking about pollution, Black carbon aerosols cause warming by absorbing solar energy. Most other aerosols, such as sulfur, reflect solar energy and have a cooling effect. Obviously, they're not doing as much as that. So here we, once again, graph. We love them, okay? Radiative forcing. I had a problem reading that. Just work with me is the amount of change in thermal energy that a given factor exerts on the Earth's temperature. That looks like a term you're going to need to know. Positive forcing warms the surface, negative cools it. So good news, here they're showing you the aerosol, cools it. Surface albedo, we'll talk about surface albedo. Did we talk about that before? It's like the sun's reflection or absorption of radiation. So when all factors are considered, the Earth is experiencing a net Radiative forcing of that amount. Yeah, it's not pretty folks, it's just not. Science data. As tropospheric temperatures increase, that's the one we're living in because remember troposphere, stratosphere. More water should evaporate and enter the atmosphere. There are two different scenarios for how this will affect climate change. Uh oh, we got options. Which one do we wanna pick? More atmospheric water vapor could lead to more warming, causing more evaporative in a positive feedback loop. Remember, you need to know the difference between a positive feedback loop and a negative feedback loop. Negative feedback loop is, for example, your air conditioning system. We've done this before. And this is an example of a positive feedback loop. You add more, it keeps getting hotter, hotter, hotter. So, more atmospheric water vapor could enhance cloudiness, reflecting sunlight back into the space, and slow warming in a negative feedback loop so they can ask you to give examples of what would be a positive and what would be a negative in the feedback loop. And this all has to do the same thing with water vapor. So make sure you can, once again, connect those dots for an FRQ because our FRQs are worth an awful lot. So it obviously varies all the time. We have things called seasons, which are involved with the axis of the Earth, our little tilt, okay? And over thousands of years, the Earth wobbles on its axis, varies its tilt, and experiences changes in the shape of its orbit in a regular long-term cycle called that. Yep, not going to pronounce it. I'm going to guess that's the dude that figured it out. No one's going to ask you. I promise. If not, come back and tell me I was wrong. But so far, no one's ever asked that guy's name. So the sun... For a while at the beginning probably like 20 years ago when we started talking about climate change and we were really trying to blame it on people they were like oh no solar flares it's one of the sun cycles ah uh, we figured out that is not it okay scientists believe that that has not had a significant effect on the earth's average surface temperature only that much okay the oceans hold 50 times more carbon than the atmosphere 50 times 
but are absorbing less carbon dioxide than we're adding to the atmosphere. As oceans warm, gases like carbon dioxide are less soluble. You need the colder temperatures to hold in um, gases. It's like the concept of, you know, you leave a soda in your car and you open it up and it explodes because it was hot, all the molecules were moving around. However, you have that same soda and you have that in your refrigerator and the bubbles stay contained. As oceans warm, gases like carbon dioxide are less soluble, creating a positive feedback loop that accelerates warming. All good news all the time. So thermal haline circulation, we talked about that when we talked about ocean circulation, thermo, haline, thermo is temperature, haline is salt. So the thermal haline circulations of the oceans moves warm tropical water north where the heat is released near Western Europe, which is why Western Europe has the moderate climate that it has. Whereas if you look at that same latitude, it, nope, like this for you guys, right? This way, okay? So you go over like this and you go from Western Europe and you go to like Dakota, north or south, I don't know, pick one, okay? That's a vast difference on how those areas have temperature fluctuations, climate, things like that. And that has to do basically with our Gulf Stream going up there and bringing up warm water. This is what happened already. Multi-year climate variables also arise from El Nino, southern isolation. You need to remember that. We did that also. Systematic shifts in atmospheric pressures, sea surface temperature, and ocean circulation in the tropical Pacific Ocean. That's going to affect, remember, El Nino years. We, we mentioned that um, that's going to bring in more rain, things like that, to like Arizona, Southern California doesn't have um, the accumulation of nutrients coming up and circulating or vertical circulation because the cool water didn't come up. Go back and look at that. All right, which is not a greenhouse gas, oxygen, okay? You can look at that. You can push pause on YouTube, you know? Think about it. <gasps> so, studying climate change. Lots of scientists have been doing this for quite some time, okay? Evidence about paleoclimate, the climate in the ancient past, is vital for providing a baseline. And you can see these really, it's kind of cool, go and look at some other videos where it talks about taking core ice samples and things like that, and it shows all the dissolved um, gases that were in the atmosphere and what proportion they were in. So proxy indicators are types of indirect measurements that serve as substitutes for direct measurements. That seems random on that slide, but we'll just move past that. Look, man, and it's not like it's the second time today I'm giving this one. This is just the first time. So climate scientists drill into ice caps, ice sheets, and glaciers to analyze the tiny bubbles of atmosphere that collect as the ice form. Look, that's a job. Drilling out ice holes and then analyzing them. They have like an entire collection of them. There's a better term. It'll come to me at another time when I'm not doing this. So glaciers in, in Antarctica have provided information back 800,000 years. 800,000 years of information and data we have on climate. We can show that it's changed. We can show how long it's taken to change and what conditions were around that caused the change. Other proxy measurements include Sediment cores drilled below bodies of water, tree rings. I have no idea what a pack rack middens in an arid region is. Google that, okay, I, I, I don't know. And the isotope concentrations of samples for coral reefs. Okay, that I get. Woo, there's a big one. Temperature change, carbon dioxide, methane. Years before present. So we have had, you can see, we've had fluctuations. And no one's saying that it, the climate has not fluctuated over the planet. No one is denying that one. Oh, Mauna Loa, Hawaii. So in 58, Keeling began analyzing hourly air samples in Hawaii's Mauna Loa Observatory. So this is cool because remember, Hawaii on this big island, it's got like almost all of the possible climates that we have on the planet. It goes all the way down from tropical, tropical desert, tropical rainforest, all the way up to snow on the top. And the observatory is there because obviously it's really high up and there's nothing else around it. So it's good to have the observatory there. So carbon dioxide concentrations have been increasing from this much to this much. Wow. 
hourly air condition. So then we have some models, which is where you take computer information, put it all in, someone writes an algorithm, you know how that works. Our programs that combine what's known about the atmospheric circulation, ocean circulation, atmosphere ocean interactions, and feedback cycles to stimulate climate dynamics. So current models are imperfect because the Earth's climate system is complex. No, climate system is complex, something to do with the Earth, here's a shocker. That's why one answer, you always have to be tweaking. With science, you're always tweaking because you always get new data and then you have to analyze the new data and put it towards data that you already had. Always changing, nothing's chiseled in stone. You know, except stuff chiseled in stone. Climate change has already had numerous impacts on the physical properties of our planet, on organisms, ecosystems, and on human well-being. If we can start figuring out, okay, and putting forth more of human well-beings, obviously more people are going to get on board, right? How is it going to affect me? How is it going to affect my life, and how is it going to affect my life now? It also predicts future changes in these phenomena, as well as impacts on wildlife, ecosystems, and society. So, a couple people with the wildlife, a couple people with the ecosystems, pretty much how it's going to affect me, that's important. Oh, take that all in. You can pause it. I got nothing to say. Okay. So, there's an intergovernmental panel on climate change. It was established in 88 by the UN, and it was used to review and summarize all available data and climate studies for policymakers and the general public. Remember, in our last YouTube video, um, we talked about the Montreal Protocol with ozone, okay? You need to know about the IPCC. The acronym is always shown, it's, all, it's not like one where they're gonna ask you, here's a cat's gonna have to jump, it's gonna shake, I'm sorry, I don't know what to tell you. Huh? She's not as klutzy as Chester. So, in 1314, it released its fifth assessment report summarizing trends in surface temperature, precipitation patterns, snow and ice, sea levels, storm intensity. We know, I mean, if you've been around, even you guys, just for like 10 years, thinking about hurricanes and how much stronger they've been, not necessarily more frequent, but the, the cat three and above's, had just been phenomenal over the past 10 years, and that was not seen before. And average surface temperature, both land and ocean, have risen about 1.1 degrees Celsius. And most of it's occurred since the 70s. And think of what's happened since the 70s, let alone cars, but you have all these countries moving from being developing to developed, going through the process of industrialization. Look at what we've had here. Greater than. Whoa. Okay. So in the U.S., temperatures in most areas have risen by more than one full degree just in the past two decades. I mean, if you go back and you look at some houses, you can go, go east and look at some old houses. Okay, those things that were built in the 40s and the 50s, they didn't have air conditioning. They had those jealousy windows and things like that. That was because there was a cool ocean breeze and it was cool enough to be here in the summer when you had that breeze going. Oh, heck no, it's like 104 here in the summer now. It never was that way when, they, when people originally started moving down to South Florida. So this trend will continue because we're still emitting greenhouse gases and the ones already in the atmosphere will continue to warm for decades, even if we stop now. That doesn't mean don't do anything. Okay, look at look at the work. Look at that. Oh my goodness. No wonder why Alaska is melting. Okay, that's ridiculous. So future changes in temperature are predicted to vary from region to region. Polar regions are expected to have, take the biggest hit, and they're already showing it. So precipitation is changing. So now, what are we gonna do about that? Because we know we're cutting down rainforests, right? We know rainforests contribute to water in the atmosphere through the process of transpiration. Yes, those are things that you need to know and be able to tie two and two together. And then we increase the overall temperature of the planet and obviously we're gonna have differences in precipitation. Areas that were dry are going to be drier. Areas that are wet could get wetter. And those things may happen 
times where before they didn't, they didn't happen. So in other words, if you had a rainy season, yeah, we get that. It might be rainier, but maybe your dry season, all of a sudden you take a, a dump of water. So um, areas can't handle that kind of change. A warmer atmosphere speeds evaporation and holds more water vapor, and precipitation has increased worldwide by 2%. Overall, some regions are receiving above average amounts, while others receive less. Once again, it's not evenly distributed. We've talked about in class how um, my opinion is that water is going to be the limiting factor on human population growth, because they're going to be the haves and the haves not. Before people would migrate, you know, from one area to another. So say here, not getting any rain, okay? No water, can't grow crops, can't feed my, my folks. What am I gonna do? I'll migrate. Well, now migration from country to country is frowned upon. So, you know, then you have unhappy people. And, you know, Middle East, they, they got issues. You know, we even got problems here going on in Australia, man. And those are some happy people. So, the frequency of extreme weather events, droughts, floods, hurricanes, tornadoes, has doubled since the 1970s. Doubled, okay? And then insurers have recorded a 50% increase in losses from extreme weather. South America, a doubling of losses in Europe, and even higher rates across the rest of the world. So, now, here we start talking economics. Okay, that's pretty much all I'm going to talk about economics. But you can see that this is an issue. So it's not just a science issue. Now we're starting to talk money. Maybe more people will listen. Okay. So in 2012, study revealed a potential explanation for the increase in extreme weather. Warming has been greatest in the Arctic, weakening the intensity of the Northern Hemisphere's polar jet stream. Okay, we've all heard about the jet stream. This influences why it's shorter to come back from California than it is to travel there. You always see systems moving across the United States like this. We're not talking about tropical systems that come up like this from Florida, but the jet stream is a high altitude air current that flows west to east in a curving pattern that wanders north to south. Now this, it's not just over the United States because you know, the planet is circular. So it goes around the whole thing. So, and if you guys would ever watch the Weather Channel, I mean, I keep telling the Weather Channel, it is something to watch. There's not normally sad stuff. They put happy things on there. You could see how this is affecting our weather because of the change in climate. I know. So, as the jet stream slows down, its north and south loops become normal, forming atmospheric blocking patterns because it blocks the eastward movement of weather patterns. So, they can get stuck here, they can get stuck here, this causes weather patterns to be held in place for longer periods of time. What did we have? They had a hurricane that went and hit Houston, Texas and sat there for like five days. I don't remember what it's called because, you know, I'm old and I've been through a lot of hurricanes. Glaciers. Man, this is just sad. They're doing that. Do you know they're having like, where was it? Was it Sweden or Switzerland? You know, one of those places. They were actually holding funeral services for the loss of their glaciers. Okay, so many tropical mountaintop glaciers have disappeared and the few that are remaining are shrinking. One out of six people worldwide live in regions that depend on mountain meltwater as a source of fresh water. So here's Jackson Glacier all the way down here in 1911. Here it is in 2009. Okay, Southern California gets its water from snow melt. You can see the glaciers, look at that. The world's major glaciers are shrinking. That's a big chunk. Polar ice is also melting very quickly with the entire West Antarctic ice shelf potentially on its way to an unstoppable collapse. That's depressing every year that I read this. This would create a three meter rise in sea level. Three meters, in case you can't do that math, that's over nine feet. Go look at the average surface level of Florida. I mean, you pretty much have to like move on top of a mountain of trash or something like that, or, you know, be going over on a bridge to get to nine feet in Florida. At least in Southern Florida, there are like hills and stuff in Northern. But down here, your Pembroke Pines house may be waterfront property, just saying. So 
As snow and ice melts, less reflective surfaces um, is exposed. This is, we're talking about the albedo effect. Where's it here? Okay. So what happens is, think about it, ice, snow, white. White reflects the sun's rays. Okay, so think about, the, let's go with the north. Let's go with the Arctic. So ice reflects it. What happens is it starts to melt and what shows up? Water, which is blue, or ground, which is green or brown, depending on what it is. Those are darker colors, so they then absorb more heat, okay? Causing then that area to heat up more rapidly. So there you have a positive feedback. The loss of the Arctic sea ice has led to the opening of new shipping lanes and many countries jockeying for position to claim regions of the Arctic for oil and mineral extraction. Now think about that, all right? So we have travel now is available, so we're sending combustion engines to areas that are already having an um, exponential almost increase in their temperature. That was my half hour pause because I know that last time it took me forever to upload the 43 minutes. So we're going to pause there and there'll be a part two.